Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ajay Parasaram and I'm an assistant professor in the Departments of International Development Studies and the Department of History at Dalhousie University. I'm also cross-appointed to the Department of Political Science and I'm a founding fellow at the McKechn Institute for Public Policy and Governance, all here at Dalhousie. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to you today. I've been asked to kind of give you a sense about some of the work that our colleagues across the many disciplines represented in FAST, the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, uh, kind of work on. And uh, it was really challenging actually to think about nailing down one topic to talk about. When I was first asked to do this, uh, it was a few months ago, and I really wanted to focus on um, you know, the politics of shutting down the economy in solidarity with the hereditary chiefs of the Wissowet Nation. Uh, and then that quickly, um, uh, following up on that quickly came the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and then uh, following up on that came uh, the resurgence in the politics of Black Lives Matter. And amidst all of it, I think one of the common trends that uh, was popping up in terms of public media consumption was you know questions about violence questions about uh who gets to use violence and for what reason um who experiences violence as well so i thought maybe one of the more useful things that i could do in you know 15 20 minutes here with you is to focus in on as much as we can on this question of violence on the difference between structural violence and uh, violence that might manifest as individual forms of violence so that's what I decided that I would focus on today. I'm just gonna share my screen with you and get started um, with a couple of slides to kind of help, help us through. Uh, here we go. All right. So what you see here is um, taken from uh, generic media, uh, an image that will be familiar to anyone uh, anywhere in the world right now. Uh, which is a series of heavily militarized police um, and riot gear taking a knee in front of protesters who are out on the streets demanding justice for uh, Black, Black Lives Matter uh, as part of the Black Lives Matter movement, in particular focusing on uh, the recent police killing of George Floyd, which we'll get to more uh, in a few minutes. So by the end of today's kind of mini lecture, you are going to be able to explain the difference between structural violence and individual violence, what makes them different. Uh, you'll be able to talk a little bit about the history, the roots of nonviolent civil disobedience and Jain Hindu and Buddhist ideas as articulated by the Indian uh, social activist and political strategist Mohandas K. Gandhi. And you're going to hopefully, my hope is that by the end of today's talk, you'll be able to form your own opinion on uh, media and state representations of violence and who gets to use violence and, and how people engaged in this mass civil movements um, might position themselves in response to state desires to represent violence one way or another. So to jump right into it, we have to think, when we think about the question of violence, we need to think about what uh, structural violence looks like, is what its history is, and what its contemporary significance is, and then differentiate that from uh, the way individual violence might be experienced. So, you know, the first uh, most significant way for those of us in Canada, for those of us based at Dalhousie, to be thinking about uh, in terms of structural violence is this idea of uh, Nova Scotia itself, the idea of the territory being called New Scotland. Uh, that is in and of itself an example of structural, historical, ontological, epistemic violence that is invested in the colonial strategy of erasing the reality of, uh, you know, indigenous cartography of indigenous uh, land. Um, this is simultaneously now Mi'kma'ki and Nova Scotia and the contradictions of working through the simultaneousness and co-constitution of Mi'kma'ki and Nova Scotia is the inheritance of everybody who lives on these territories. But, first and foremost, long before the idea of Nova Scotia ever existed, this land was known as Mi'kma'ki. And it's not enough to just think about it as, as a question of treaty. Treaty is a useful way to kind of start, but uh, you, the more significant way is to think about, um, you know, the whole Canadian project as something that's 
fundamentally imbued with a form of violence, a very significant form of violence that uh, takes the form of genocide, cultural genocide. Um, but, you know, that's a huge other topic that we'll have to spend, that many of my colleagues across the faculty spend a lot of time thinking about. Another example of structural violence that's again rooted in uh, where I am here in uh, Chibuktuk, also known as Halifax, is the fact that black men in the city are stopped by the police six times more frequently than white men. And this is a structural phenomenon that's based on a long legacy of anti-black racism that has uh, been present in this territory uh, for a very, very long time, hundreds of years. So it is not an accident, it's not a mistake, it is not a question of strategic policing policy review uh, that leads to this phenomena of the overcriminalization of black men, rather it's a function of the systemic racism and the representation of blackness as a crime to be solved, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, people engaged in, in life like everybody else. Now, conversely, if we think about the individual experiences of violence, this might be, for example, a white man being mugged walking down the street. It's a very unfortunate and bad thing to happen but they're not intersecting structures of violence and oppression coalescing around uh, you know, uh, embodied cisgendered white male walking home uh, that might lead him to be living in fear. There may be other issues, parts of his identity that might you know, uh, represent structural forms of violence, but um, just a, you know, uh, a white man walking down the street and getting mugged for it doesn't represent the same kinds of uh, violence and, and experience of violence as a black man just driving around town. Another example of individual violence that doesn't specifically involve people uh, experiencing the violence is, the, is uh, the burning of a police car during a protest. We see endless amounts of images of this sort of thing because it serves that discursive purpose of representing protest as being inherently violent, which is why I dwell on the, on the example. Uh, burning a police car or any car or throwing a brick through a window, this tends to get represented as uh, evidence of, of violence. Now, you know, people are, you know, those of you who are reading the, about this in the media, you'll hear there's always a lot of back and forth about who started what and who escalated what. My point is that we shouldn't be dwelling on that distinction at all. And, you know, like a window can be fixed, a cop car can be rebuilt or replaced or something like that. But, you know, George Floyd's life can never be returned or, or the countless hundreds of thousands of uh, indigenous and black men, women and children who have died at the hands of structural violence because of the way that structural violence, racist violence has been enacted upon them simply for being who they are. Uh, you know, that it's a completely different manifestation of uh, violence. So you see George Floyd's mural here that he can't breathe. Um, and then conversely, we see a fire burning over a car of some sort in the other. These are not equivalent forms of violence, uh, but they are oftentimes treated as if, you know, any violence is, is bad violence. And there's a logic to that. There's, a, there's roots to that idea, which we'll talk about next. And in order to understand that logic, we have to understand where kind of uh, the idea of civil disobedience as peaceful uh, mass resistance kind of comes from. And its historical origins in the 20th century anyway, come through uh, the legacy of Mohandas K. Gandhi, who was an Indian civil rights leader who developed a political philosophy that he named Satyagraha, that manifests in the real world as peaceful civil disobedience. Of course, Satyagraha is actually like quite a complex um, philosophy that draws on influences from Jainism, from Buddhism, from Hinduism, all of which Gandhi was kind of conversant with. And in, in a nutshell, Satyagraha means truth force or soul force. And it comes from the Jain concept of amsa or non-injury and, and not to do violence onto another. And with it, it comes a philosophical and, and material commitment to truth telling and living your truth uh, in the face of evil. So uh, at the core of Satyagraha comes this ethic. There's a philosophical ethic that uh, 
You should do no violence, do no harm outwardly, and instead absorb harm. Let, allow the oppressor to harm you uh, until the oppressor is re-educated through realizing the aberrant nature of what it is that they're doing. Uh, Satyagraha uh, is a very good sort of quote and unquote weapon of the week in terms of thinking about um, what people who maybe don't have the military or material capacity to overthrow their oppressors uh, can do in terms of strategically and tactically winning in social movements. Uh, in the case of the Indian National Movement, this took the form after many attempts to violently overthrow the British state uh, to then organize in a different way that sort of undermined, to pull the rug out from underneath the British over time uh, and because they were able, Satyagrahis were able to uh, make use of the media uh, to draw attention to the kind of gross inequities of colonialism. And this strategy was, was picked up and developed and adapted into different contexts by Nelson Mandela in South Africa, by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States, both of whom uh, took these principles of uh, you know, street justice and, and civil disobedience uh, and nonviolent civil disobedience in particular in their own direction. Here's an example, a uh, historical example from India. This is uh, Satyagraha and the Salt March. Um, Indians were not allowed to make their own salt. They were forced to purchase it from the British. So in, in an act of mass civil disobedience, Gandhi led thousands and thousands of people on a huge march across a significant portion of the Indian subcontinent to a beach where they then collectively put their hands in the water and they made salt, uh, which seems like not a big deal. You know, like those of you probably uh, any of you if you go to your drawers you'll probably find some salt kicking around somewhere it's not generally seen as a very expensive commodity but it's never been about the actual cost of the salt it was about the act of demonstrating to the british uh who had power you know you hear about power to the people well people who refuse to be governed by the unjust laws of society cannot be governed because there's just too many of them so what Gandhi wrote in a letter to the Viceroy, uh, Lord Irwin, on the 2nd of March, 1930 was, my ambition is no less than to convert the British people through nonviolence and thus make them see the wrong that they have done to India. So you see that politics of taking the violence into yourself uh, as a method of uh, re-educating the oppressor. And in this case, it's actually a very, I would say charitable uh, strategy because what Gandhi was trying to do was to absorb harm, uh, take it on to the Indian people by way of helping the British to understand themselves as oppressors. Now, in, by the time this gets adapted and deployed in America, um, there's been a lot of sophistication on this idea. The state itself has uh, started to learn um, and then Martin Luther King, the kind of side of Martin Luther King that uh, people don't oftentimes engage with, uh, demonstrates that, that Dr. King had a very sophisticated understanding of, um, you know, violence and, 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 and diversity of tactics in, in social movements as well. Um, and while he understood and was a champion of nonviolence, I think he understood that it, you know, people within the movement should be talking amongst themselves about the, what it is they're doing and, and people from outside who are judging that movement shouldn't uh, be the ones who are coming down in one way or the other. So this is a quote from a letter he wrote from the Birmingham jail on April the 16th of 1963. And he says, first, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill 
is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. So you see what Dr. King is talking about here is um, the fact that um, you really do have to be engaged in the movement in order to, to uh, play a role in steering the direction and people outside of that movement shouldn't be the ones dictating uh, what is and is not acceptable. So why the obsession with nonviolence? And I wanna spend the last few minutes here uh, talking to you about how focusing only in on the violence and equating state violence and individual violence uh, actually serves to um, advance the interests of the status quo. Now, activists learn from movements. You know, we know that activists are always learning from the movements, but so does the state. And when the state learns from uh, observing activist movements, uh, it can specifically use the tactic of co-option uh, in order to depoliticize the sort of, how shall we put it, the cutting edge of social movements or like the sharp teeth of social movements. And it makes it, it pacifies the movement. So by focusing on property damage or individual experiences of violence, what ends up happening is that we equate anti-black violence and death with property violence. And we reduce the politics of our political movement only to that narrative. Um, when we accept that our political leaders, prime ministers, ministers, what have you, or police chiefs or police officers, when they quote unquote take a knee uh, and are represented as sort of good intentioned people trying to do the best they can, it is not significantly different from Martin Luther King's point about the white moderate who says, you know, we want to be peaceful um, and, and we reject this kind of violence. And you can see this narrative playing out over and over again, where the media will capture a person, uh, engage in the movement, and then ask them a pointed question about violence. And, and then that person uh, almost always will articulate a point that, oh, well, you know, we're not violent, or these radicals came from out of our community, and this and that. Well, if radicals are always coming from someone else's community, it seems to suggest that they don't live anywhere. So what we have to accept is that there are different pieces of movements that uh, articulate their politics in different ways. And you as a member of a movement, as someone uh, fighting for social justice, you don't have to agree with uh, everyone all the time. This is the meaning of solidarity, actually. There's a really big difference between solidarity and unity. And that's a subject that's really close to my heart. And I, I think that unity is uh, a lofty goal that can materialize sometimes, but you should never allow a lack of unity to get in the way of building solidarity. And out of that solidarity, you may uh, in fact end up with unity, but you don't need unity in order to have solidarity. And what does solidarity look like in this context? Well, solidarity within social movements could take the form of agreeing to disagree within the movement, but not condemning strategies that we disagree with for public consumption, recognizing that it only serves the interests of the status quo when we allow ourselves to be manipulated by, uh, by, by mainstream media or politicians or what have you. The expectation is for people to come out and to carve divisions. You know, it's not significantly different. Uh, well, it is significantly different, but it's not altogether different from the colonial strategy of divide to rule that served the, the interests of the British Empire so well. So solidarity as a verb, uh, solid, if we think of solidarity as a verb as opposed to solidarity as a noun, uh, what, I, what I mean by that is that it's not enough solidarity. You can't say that you are in solidarity because of a hashtag or because of a feeling that you have inside yourself. It doesn't matter what you think. And, and this is kind of maybe an unusual uh, point to hear from a university professor, but what you think is not as important as what you do. It is important to think, don't get me wrong, and you have to think. Thinking and doing are two parts of the same thing, which we call praxis. Uh, but to think that you can be in solidarity in some abstract sense makes no sense at all. 
in order to be in solidarity, you have to be actively doing something. So when police officers, such as the ones pictured in, uh, on the first slide I showed you, are taking a knee in their riot gear, only to then stand up and, you know, violently push back against protesters, they are still uh, realizing their purpose as the sort of violent arm and extension of the state and state power. So it is actually not possible for a police officer to be in solidarity. Uh, with a movement that is specifically taking aim at police brutality. Because what that solidarity would have to look like might be resigning from the police force or, or not being a police officer. And I recognize that that's controversial, but you know, the university does not shy away from controversy. We have to kind of investigate like the long-term significance of what these uh, practices in society mean. And this is the sort of thing that you'll all be doing if, should you decide to study social sciences. So, oh, I guess that takes me to the end of uh, my slides. So I'm gonna just stop sharing the screen here and just leave you with a, uh, you know, a warm invitation to continue thinking about these issues, regardless of what you choose to study. Uh, if you come to Dalhousie, uh, my colleagues and I across the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, uh, we all have a huge different diversity in terms of like viewpoints. And um, one of the great things about an education in social sciences and humanities is that you get to develop your own thinking uh, about many of these controversial issues of history and, and politics. So um, good luck, and I hope to see you in Chibuktuk soon. <laughs>